Hi, everyone, Vol and Loud. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone tonight to tonight's panel. Uh, my name is Shannon McKinnon, and I'm the Director of Career Development and Work Integrated Learning. And tonight's panel is brought to you by the Alumni um, Relations, uh, the Shumka Center, and our department, which is Career Services and Work Integrated Learning. Um, and I want to thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, the panel, which uh, is taking place here on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. Uh, and the panel is called Building Your Network, and it's part of the Alumni Career Pathway Series. Our moderator uh, tonight is Annie Briard. Uh, Annie challenges visual perception through moving images, installations, expanded and print photography to emphasize, emphasize paradigm that I can't read tonight. Par paradigm. We don't need to go through that. Okay, thing. you don't need to. Anyways, Annie's great, and <laughs> <laughs> Annie's alumni, and, a very, and an excellent uh, artist. Uh, and teach us here as well as working artist herself. Um, and I'll let Annie take it from here. And thank you so much for joining us. Is this on? You hear me? I hear a little echo. Um, thanks so much, Shannon, for the introduction. Um, and thanks for inviting me to come and moderate tonight. I'm really excited to chat with all of these artists and hopefully with all of you. I hope that everybody who's here uh, feels very welcome to join in the conversation because um, that is more what this is intended to be, right? Conversation. So what I'll do is I'll briefly introduce uh, each of our panelists and then we'll jump into some questions. So I'll start with uh, Jazz, who's right here to my right. Um, <laughs> Jazz Broden Gilchrist is a Canadian comic artist with a BFA in illustration from Emily Carr. Growing up as an adopted kid, an only black person in his family, identity was more of a struggle for him than he realized, but he found that he was able to express this through the safe distance of storytelling. He enjoys creating diverse fantasy settings that explore identity, complex familial relationships, uh, and responsibility. His other passions include D&D, &D, Ultimate Frisbee. There's a really cool photo of you on your website <laughs> playing Ultimate Frisbee. Uh, briefly a professional athlete and engineering casual conversations to be verbal Rube Goldbergs that culminate in bland puns. Okay, so you're like in the hot seat tonight. I feel like we're gonna look, we're gonna look to you for some of that. Um, and then next to Jazz, uh, we have Mimi Martins. Nimi is an interaction and product designer from Lagos, Nigeria, who currently lives here in Vancouver. She obtained her master's uh, here from Emily Carr University um, and has a background in web and interaction design. She's focused on creating meaningful user experiences through uh, various digital products. Her professional experience spans the uh, SAS and FinTech industries, where she has contributed to designing digital products that streamline business operations. Uh, thanks for being here, Mimi. I feel like the SAS probably stands for something that I, as a non-designer, I'm not privy to, but maybe we can get into that later. <laughs> uh, and then our third speaker tonight is uh, Kunal Sen. Kunal is an animation director and motion designer, and the bad half of Good Bad Habits, a small mom and pop animation studio based here in Vancouver. Originally from Calcutta in India, uh, Kunal did his first degree in graphic design in India, and then he came and specialized in animation here at Emily Carr University. Mixing a diverse range of influences, genres, and interests, Kunal likes to create compelling and memorable stories in each and every project that he works on. Uh, clients, uh, prestigious clients, have spanned Google, Spotify, Skillshare, Wikipedia, Telus, uh, and many, many more. 
He's also directed uh, several short educational films on the topic of healthcare, technology, history, and science. Uh, can I read this last part too? I love this last part. <laughs> Kunal is also an extremely proud and happy father of two uh, very naughty girls, it says, <laughs> and is secretly more excited to be a parent than he is an animator. I probably wasn't supposed to read that part. Oh, <laughs> Um, he went through a midlife crisis recently, uh, interestingly, and bought a very expensive electric guitar, which he plays when everyone at home is asleep. Um, and so your your concert will be here tomorrow night as well, right? Like, people come back for that, please. That's going to be awesome. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you all for being here. So today we're going to talk about networking and i see a few folks in the room that i know and that we've been having some of those conversations with um so networking you know we always we always say in the arts that skill and talent and practice is so important but a big part of it is also who you know right and who your connections are and whether we love it or hate it that's kind of how the cookie crumbles um so we'll sort of investigate that uh, tonight. So I think we'll look at both the networking side, but also the community building side, because I think that it's not necessarily the same thing. So maybe we can tease out those nuances and um, yeah, see, see where that gets us. So I've got some questions here. We'll go through them. Uh, but if some questions come up for folks in the audience as well, please just feel free to give us a wave and uh, we, can, we can send the mic over to you and make sure that you're part of the conversation. Okay, I'm going to ask a general question and then whoever wants to go first can go for it. How has networking played a role in building your career and what approaches to networking have been the most successful for you? <laughs> Thank you, Jazz. You definitely didn't hear us like planning who's going to go first or anything. <laughs> uh, first of all, just acknowledging pretty good color coordination, right? Even though we've never <laughs> met each other before, like not bad. Um, so networking, hoof. Networking has helped um, for three of sort of like the biggest things that I do that are part of my life. So those three things are um, I have a literary agent um, that helps me with comic books. Um, and one day the industry is going to be ready for Afro fantasy and then they'll buy my stuff. Um, <laughs> and then um, I work at a place called Ethos Lab, which is not actually very far from here. It's on Main and 3rd. Um, and it is a place that does after school programming for youth. Um, that's focused around STEAM and then is uh, Black Run. Um, we'll get more into that later, but that's been a huge part of my life. Um, and then my main job there is actually um, <clears throat> sort of story building and like working with youth to help them with like illustration and all that kind of stuff. And we actually made like a book of lore um, for Ethos Lab that's now in the Museum of Anthropology. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, and then the other thing is just um, at comic conventions, I do select a few of those, the ones that I like, um, where I sell um, my work. But network, none of that really would happen if I lived in a total void. Um, I will say I think it really is skill and luck and then being like skill, luck, and authenticity. I think that the authenticity part often gets left out. Um, but it's like with my agent very specifically, like when she reached out to me, I had like work that was ready to go. So that was like the skill in preparation for the luck because you can't control the luck. But I think what really sealed the deal was just like um, when you when you get an agent offer, they'll usually ask to have like a call or some sort of conversation with you um, just to sort of like test if you get along. Um, and I think that's what really sealed the deal because at that point we were just having so much fun and there was so much like genuine connection um, that I think that was like as if not more important than just the work um, because I think at least for me, the per people who I want to work with are the people who actually want to work with me, which is a, I've been told that's not a good way to make statements. Um, but like generally caring about each other and then each other's like politics and like making sure that stuff like that is aligned is going to help when you're at like really hard decisions about like 
is this person going to champion what I believe in or are they just going to be focused purely on the commercial aspect? Um, I don't know if I answered the question. Um, <laughs> did I answer the question? Did I start? I thought that was pretty great. Um, I, I think especially talking about the authenticity in building those connections, right? And the genuineness in building connections. Um, yeah, no, that, that was really helpful. I think, uh, oh, yeah, no, I'm not going to jump in. I think there's a lot that we could say on that, but maybe we'll continue. Um, thank you, Jazz. Did anybody else want to have have a few thoughts about that. How has networking played a role in building your career and which approaches maybe you were most successful in that we can share with the with the group? Yeah, um, I think for me, uh, talking about my work is the big one. Um, talking about what I'm planning, what the ideas I have. Um, a lot of times people have this, and I don't know if it's just like a design or an arts thing where they're like, don't talk about your work. Someone might steal your ideas, you know, keep it to yourself. But the truth about it is or the things that I have seen the most is I get the most, um, the most thoughts and like advances talking to people about my work, like sitting down with my classmates or just with like designers in general or people that are not even in the design industry. Like the last project that I did was more focused on um, like real people and bringing a community together. And so all the networking I did or most of the networking I did, I did in a salon, I did um, at a nail table, I did in spaces where design isn't generally spoken about in like, so that's kind of the thing, like, don't be afraid to, um, like, talk about your work because you do gain ideas even in spaces where you don't think it's design-centered or design-focused. Um, yeah, so that's been the approach that works for me, sitting down and, like, you know, just talking about your work. You don't know who's interested in your work. You don't know who has an idea that they could share with you. And it Honestly, sometimes it, it might not even be an idea that is centered to design. And then a few months later, you're sitting like, oh, my God, this could work. This is something that I could bring into into my work. So, yeah, I think it would just be like, don't be scared. Like if it's something that you're interested in, I mean, obviously, don't go around like giving all your ideas to people for free. You should be paid for your work and for your thoughts and ideas. But um, don't be scared to talk about your ideas or whatever you're working on because you don't know where like the network and other connections come from. Sometimes it is just somebody who knows somebody and right who's kind of inspired. I wonder just before we um, just before we move on, I wonder, Nimi, would you mind uh, telling uh, telling us just a little bit more about that project? Because part of the question is approaches and what an amazing project that that you have right that you because you you sort of mentioned and brushed off like oh sometimes a conversation in a nail salon but it's so much more than that like you really created a whole sort of I don't know approach or a system that yeah. that you made a network and do you mind just giving us a few, um, few words about yeah it? yeah yeah um so the project that I did was called um manicure mixer design lessons from a black beauty saloon um, it was essentially uh, an event that I brought together just to bring black women into the same space. So, so a little backstory, um, when it comes to black women or black people in general, our hair is uh, like a sense of identity and connection. Growing up, you kind of like sitting down or um, your mom is making your hair, your auntie is making your hair, or you're going to a salon where everyone comes together and you have that sense of connection and community. And since moving to Vancouver, I kind of realized that we didn't have that anymore. When I moved here, I went to about like five or six salons really thinking that I could get my hair done and none of them did black hair. None of them, I was like walking into salons with just like white people. I'm like, hi guys, do you do braids? <laughs> and they were like, no, sorry, we don't do braids here. And it was one of those um, realizations that I, that I had where it was, um, there's a sense or a part of our identity that we don't have as much anymore. And saloons have been third spaces for black people um, in the U.S. It was one of those places where they used it as um, to fight for um, civil justice and rights. And so saloons are more than just spaces for beauty. They're also places that um, advocate for change. And so the event was um, to recreate a black beauty saloon in Vancouver where we could bring them together and um, to actually talk about issues that are affecting the black community here. Um, 
just in a way that is culturally resonant to the community. So it was more about like designing with a community in a way that resonates with the community and also looking at um, what is the equivalent of a black beauty saloon in different communities, like for the Asian community or for, um, I don't know, the LGBTQ community, what is the equivalent or what is that third space for them? Um, so yeah, that was, that was, that was the last project that I worked on. Um, yeah, just focused on community designing and community building and engagement. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for sharing that. Cornell? Hey, um, <clears throat> so um, I guess networking, so for me, uh, I have a love-hate relationship with that word, but I'll explain in a bit. Uh, so I came to Vancouver for Emily Carr in 2006, so I already kind of had, a, I did, did my undergrad in India in design. So when I came here, I kind of knew no one, zero, zero people, and so I was kind of like starting from scratch, like. In India, I knew people before I was born, like, you know, you have a network before you're born, right? Like wherever you're born, you, your parents know people, your friends. And so when you kind of come here to a foreign country to study and to work, then you kind of start from scratch. So it's kind of easier in some ways to uh, track your networking. Because I know at one, when my flight landed, I knew, I knew zero people. And today I know a lot of people. And something happened in the middle. <laughs> That's, I guess, some of it was networking. Um, but the way I like to look at it is um, networking can sometimes come off as a little bit uh, uh, forced sometimes. When you try to network, you kind of come across as fake or you're trying too hard and like, uh, but it's also, that's one side of the equation. The other side of the equation is living life. And I think I want to touch upon the points that have been mentioned earlier, being an authentic person, uh, being there for people, being a relatable person, communicating with people about not just work, about, hey, what, what do you do? Or how is your day going? Or how, and building connections, whether they're, you know, at Emily Carr, whether you're in uh, getting, you know, you're in a salon or whether you're in a shop, whether you're in, in Savon, buying some food, talking to someone. Being a, an authentic person is, I think, the first step of any sort of a uh, professional or personal connection. Um, and I think that has opened a lot of doors for me, both again in my personal life and in my professional life, just being there for people, being communicating, talking, asking questions. So if I try to break it down, oh, how did I get this project or how did that thing, then everything kind of goes back if you just try to connect the dots to, oh, I, I don't know, it was something really insignificant. I was in a line and in behind the grocery store and I spoke to someone and, oh, they and they have they know someone who did this and then I it's just a very organic thing so when you sit down and one time I'm gonna I'm gonna write to so many people on LinkedIn and like put my resume out there it's usually that can come across as a bit forced I mean I, I, I try to tell people like that's important that you got to do that and but that's not the only thing and I think some of y'all you guys are all students right this is a great time to think about um, some of these ideas, because like you have some time to implement them. Um, when you're a student, you actually have each other as your peers, and this is this is this place is your first best networking place. You know, you can it's on a platter for you right now. Like you can talk to this person, that person. Five years later, this person next to you might be working in a company that needs something that what you do, or is a curator of a show that. Could, and again, again, there's the two sides of the story where you don't make friends because of some ulterior motive, but the, the, that's the reality is that if you are living an authentic life around people and say, hey, I'm passionate about this, this is what I do, that people like that. People want to be around people who are authentic and, you know, add value to things, you know. So yeah, uh, I think it's a longer conversation I'd, I'd like to. Yeah, no, thank you so much for sharing that. I really love how um, you talked about, net, you, you sort of gave a description of networking that feels a little bit more organic, right? Um, oftentimes networking feels a bit like a like an icky word because it sort of it does feel maybe like like you're expecting some kind of transactional relationship or something like that. But the way that you put it was so lovely about um, 
you know, seeing networking more as connecting, connecting with humans, any human, anywhere, right? Like during any kind of moment of the day, you talked about the grocery store, or we've got the nail salon, right? It can be, it can be anywhere. Um, and I think that that's something that's, yeah, that's um, such a, such a kind of positive way to, uh, to see it and, and, and feels much more natural. No, you never know who you're, who you're going to meet or what ideas are going to come. Uh, Nimi was talking about that as well, right? Just by talking about ideas, what, what could come up. Um, I'm, I'm wondering though, when we're talking about connecting in this way, it sort of sounds maybe easy, but some people have a really hard time even just saying, hi, how's it going to the person in the, you know, checkout counter lineup with them. Do any of you have, I, I don't know if any of you have introverted, you know, pasts or tendencies. I, I certainly do as well. Yeah. Um, but do you have any um, maybe tips or approaches that if we, if we just gave like a a quick, like, let's come up with a, you know, a short list of like, here are a few options for folks that are feeling introverted or where that's particularly difficult. Is there anything that comes to mind? Maybe something you've done that's helped you with that, Jazz? Um, who, uh, when I was in kindergarten, I, <laughs> I knew I was going to be in school for 13 years or maybe even longer. It ended up being longer because of university. And I said to myself, you have to love it. Otherwise, you're going to hate it. And so I tricked myself. Um, what I do these days is I find that I can, as a big introvert, um, I find I can have a much longer, much more engaged and authentic conversation with somebody if we can find a shared interest. So like at conventions, um, honestly, I'm a horrible salesperson, but I really love to know what people's Dungeons and Dragons stories are. So like as soon as we find something like that, um, then like a point of, con like you said, a point of connection, um, then the conversation just becomes much easier because you're no longer talking about yourself or the other person. You're talking about like a shared, a shared passion. Um, so that's helped. So like often I will try to like throw out little clues that I'm a huge nerd or like if I notice something about them, then that, and like even like you brought up like hair being a connection, just something that like brings you together that's not focusing on just you or just them um, can help as a starting point. Um, yeah, so I'm, I am also a nail tech um, as well as a designer. And that means that I, <laughs> I have to talk to people all day. I have at least three clients um, during like a three or four clients a full working day, which is sometimes random strangers or regulars who I know every little secrets of their lives because people love to talk um, to, you know, it's kind of like therapy sometimes. Your, your, your nail tech or your hairdresser knows all the little secrets that you have. Um, and one of the things that I have seen or the things that I do regularly is um, um, listening to people sometimes. Like try, if you want to connect with someone, ask about something like ask about them honestly the easiest thing that I do all the time is someone sits in my chair or I meet someone is oh so how long have you been in Vancouver most people in Vancouver aren't really here like people move here things like that um so asking about something that you know you can either something shared like he said um something easy that isn't so heavy like don't go to up to a stranger and like oh so tell me like your design um tricks and like don't go super heavy because I also struggle sometimes with like talking about my projects and things like that especially after I just did um two years writing a master's thesis I needed a break from talking about my work and sometimes the connection is something light and then we can slowly work our way back into talking about like design and then connect and things like that and the truth is the first few times it might not be about design right making connections sometimes and networking is slow it's a relationship that you build on and then you can expand upon later but having the connection is the first thing like if you have the connection then if they have um you know something later on they, they can remember that oh i spoke to this person one time and maybe i can share this thing with them Um, so what is the... <laughs> we were 
just um, thank you, thank you, Nimi, for that. We were just talking about uh, potential approaches if you're somebody that's maybe yeah, tends course, more towards introversion. I, I, I just went into a parallel dimension there for a sec. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I'm an absolute extrovert. Uh, I can talk to absolutely anyone at any point of the day or night, no problems. I love it. I love people. I love finding out about their lives. So that's my personal uh, strength, and I use it. I use it genuinely. I, I'm, not, I'm actually interested when I'm talking. I'm not hustling. Um, but I also realize that uh, there's all there's people who have very. They come from very different, uh, you know, places in this department. My wife is started off being very introverted, and now I have changed her. <laughs> no, she's much more extroverted right now. But like, I think um, there is an aspect of. The difference between an introvert and an extrovert and being, you know, is it's sometimes it's too simplistic. I think it's sometimes uh, you can still be a per, an introverted person but still be able to, you know, ask questions about other people and be able to read the room and like, okay, you look a little bit unwell today or you look like you've got something on your mind and you seem like you have like I, I don't need to be like jumping around doing a dance right now but I can still be perceptive about what you're going through and what make eye contact little, little things like that help build connections and I think if you just take it like baby steps and you say like okay this is my nature I'm not the most uh, outgoing you know like you know out there person but I'm gonna work on it a little bit I'm gonna uh, I think to be able to be in a room and say like, okay, if I'm awkward, everyone else is also awkward. So let me make it easy for someone else. Let not end the story being like, oh, I'm the most awkward person in the room. Then 15 other people are also awkward. So let me just make one person's life a little less awkward by starting a conversation. That's it. That's all, you know. Um, but yeah, everyone has their own levels of, you know, how they're, depending on what you do, it's definitely going to, be a factor in your life. So if you're the kind of person who is a very specialized, you know, thing, I, I don't know, and I, I can talk about animation, I don't know, everyone's from different departments here, but in animation, some people work at studios and they're, they're like super into one thing, then yeah, I guess you, as long as you can communicate with the people who are in that world, you, you're set. For me, I own a business, so I, I'm talking to all sorts of people with all sorts of backgrounds and all sorts of subject matter. Um, it's not only about the animation, it's about the content as well, right? And there it's like, I just have to genuinely be interested. Like, you can't fake that, right? So depending on what you do, I think you have to find your own space. Oh, did you want to add something, Jazz? You can. Oh, I was just going to straight up ask, like, what programs you're in, because that could just help some of the stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Congrats. Yeah, there are a lot of folks joining us online, I think, as well. And so I don't know if uh, if you're online and you want to share in the chat what uh, what area you're in, um, then uh, yeah, we can we can monitor that and and speak more to that as well. Um, yeah, super helpful. So many so many different approaches, right? It's sort of like find something that works for you. And I think again to come back to what Jazz was stressing earlier, right? Like find something that feels authentic, so that it it doesn't feel robotic. And sometimes even just being present and being at the event or being at the thing and then people start to kind of you know notice you and recognize you and then maybe a more extroverted person will come up to you and say oh hey like I have noticed you I've noticed you around or you've been here before what's your story right um speaking of connections can you identify, and I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about it, but is it possible for you to identify a connection that you've made in the past, either through you know, uh, purposeful networking or not, but is there a connection that you've made that has proved sort of pivotal um, to, your, to your practice, uh, to your, to your yeah, career so far? And maybe we can start with jazz, because I, I know that I, just from what I was researching online, yeah, there's maybe, there's maybe a few. Do you, are you okay getting us started on that? Uh, yeah, 
Uh, so I'll go back to talking about actually. So both my connections to Ethos Lab and my connections to my agent came at about the same time and because of the same thing. Um, no surprises. They it surrounded. They both came around the time in um, summer 2020 um, when eyes were on our people. Um, oh, that's me. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, it's okay, totally okay. So um, my agent reached out to me because of um, someone was, um, Victoria Ying, who's an illustrator, was boosting um, black artists on Twitter, and then that's how I made my agent connection. But I think the most surprising connection that I didn't think would go anywhere was my connection with Ethos Lab. Um, so I had a friend in animation um, who saw a post I made about sort of like feeling a bit lonely in Vancouver um, because the black community is pretty scattered. Um, and then he connected me with a person named Anthonia, who is my current boss. And we set up a call and we did not know what to talk about. Like, it just felt like we were supposed to have it, have a conversation. And then about five minutes in, I was like, so do you play Dungeons and Dragons? <laughs> um, and she was like, nope, but that sounds interesting. And Ethos Lab was just starting then. Um, so that conversation, we just vibed, but went nowhere. And then a year later, I got a call that was like hey do you want to run like Dungeons and Dragons for just like a month for some kids and I ran that um but there was just like the world I built was very specifically for like um diaspora because I was like I don't know who I'm going to be working with but the one thing about every single black person in Vancouver is to some extent we are diaspora so that was like a connecting thing um that was just like a total of eight hours spent working with three kids um but the story sort of asked for more and then I got called back to do a mural which is weird I don't paint but we did a big mural um but it's just like a small connection and just me just choosing to be authentic during every part because at a previous job I just wasn't able to be that um and listening and like having these connections um led to me connecting not only with like people through the art but like I worked, a bunch of people helped to volunteer with the mural, um, a bunch of youth, and I met three other youth who were black and adopted into white families, which I just haven't had that. Um, we're not crying on, we're not crying during a panel. Um, <laughs> um, but like there's this connection that I, like the journey that I was going through of trying to like find black identity that I have sort of not, like I haven't had that community. Um, I the sort of like vulnerability that I was able to share with other people in similar positions, um, I think led to just so many connections um, and then like allow, encouraging people to add Lord of sort of that story to the mural um, then led to like people talking about the mural and people like wanting to do little stuff with the mural. And then my boss being like, Hey, so this story has a lot of lore. Do you want to like really develop that? And now, yeah, through every aspect of it, it's always been gone, going back to, like, what is my authentic connection? What is the people who I'm working with authentic connection? How do we put this into storytelling? Um, and now it's my main full-time job, and I get to help other people do similar things. So, yeah. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. Also, I kind of want to go see this mural now because it sounds pretty awesome. Can we see it somewhere? Uh, it, yeah, so at Main and Third on the southwest corner, you can see some of it. So it's five big panels that are facing, like, like they're on the window or, like, facing the window, so you can see those. Um, part of it, though, is, like, on a wall inside. So when those pan it's <laughs> when the panels are open, <laughs> then you can see the wall on the inside. But yeah, it's like an Afrofuturistic comic. Like I have no interest in painting, but they said Afrofuturistic comic. And I'm like, yeah, okay, let's do it. <laughs> You're like, if I must. It yes. sounds challenge accepted. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I think for me, a story that I could point out, honestly, I feel like I've already spoken about being in a nail salon, but it really... Um, it really did shape out how my last, my master's thesis project came out and also how my, um, the events that I have had and the projects that I have done afterwards. Um, so my last event, 
um, of the manicure mixer was sponsored by the city of Vancouver. And it happened, like, it was like 7th of September, just like last month. And it was one of those things that happened just just by chance. I was doing someone's nails. She booked online. Um, we're sitting down and having conversation. You know, I maybe spoke about some of my work and she spoke about her work. And I didn't really know much about, like, we just spoke about different things. Half the time we're watching Netflix and just chilling while doing nails. Um, and then we followed each other on Instagram. Turns out she works at the city of Vancouver. She was posting about the city, um, giving a grant to... Um, anyone who is doing something focused on building a community. So it was a community placemaking um, program that the city had during the summer. And that was how I saw it on her page and I saw it on someone else's page. I was like, oh, okay, I guess I'll apply for this. I applied for it, wasn't really sure. And I didn't even know they were also giving like, so the grants was for about like, um, the grants was for like $3,000. And then they were giving like an extra like amounts to anyone who's working like minority groups. They gave like um, that kind of thing. And so I applied and eventually got it. Um, and it was just one of those things where I think about where I make my connections that aren't even designed directed at all. So it was one of the, so I was able to like have this event in front of City Hall where there were 25 black women sitting down, all getting their hair done by black women. So we were like almost 40 black women in a space. People were walking around. They didn't understand what was happening. They were like, where did you find all these black people in Vancouver? And it was, I know, it was like one of the, I had people walk by. It was really nice. Um, old white lady, she walked by. She was just, she, she was just really happy to be there with all the, uh, like all the people there. And she ate some jollof rice and it was nice. It was amazing. Um, and so many connections were made. Um, and that's another thing. It was also about like um, because of the terrible, like the like the small amount of black people in Vancouver, even service providers, black service providers have a hard time reaching clients and making people and meeting people. So, yeah, it's just honestly, it's back to the same thing. Um, also, like sending out um, an email um, in 2020, 2023 last year. And in 2025 now, I'm going to be having like the opportunity to um, have the manicure mixer more as like a monthly or bi-monthly thing to like, you know, bring black people together in an actual salon. Because the last one we had, it was like out in the open, the wind was everywhere. But actually being able to do this like regularly supports people who can't afford to, you know, get their hair done or they just don't have that space, right? You need somewhere you can go to regularly and get advice from other people. So it still kind of comes back to the same thing about like, talk about your work. You don't know who you're going to meet and um, just be open, I guess. So I think that's one thing. Um, in terms of uh, pivotal, is that the word? Uh, yeah, I think something that, I mean, there are so many connections one can one makes over the course of one's career. and But I think something that I think you guys might relate to is, uh, for me, it was like when I first came to Vancouver in 2006, I was very, like, I didn't know anyone in Emily Carr in Granville Island. And I heard that there was this guy in, uh, in another animation thing that he was really good at animation. His name is Diego. And I, I'd seen some of his work. He was amazing. And I was like, I, I want to I know this guy. I want to I wanna show my work to this guy and get his feedback. And um, I remember I had this really tacky, like, CD-ROM. Do you know what CD-ROMs are? Anyone seen a CD-ROM? No? It's a thing where you put work in and you put it in a computer. But yeah, I had I printed it out and I had a nice cover and I and I, I had like 50 of no less I had a few and I was giving them out to very specific people who, you know, and I gave him a CD-ROM, you know, with my work on it that I'd done in India. And I was it, it really meant a lot to me to, you know, to make that connection. I remember that he was sitting in the library and I was like, hey, Diego, I, I, I've heard about you and I want to I want to show you my work. I'd love to hear what you think about it. And just boom, I went in there, you know, and uh, it was it's one of those friendships that like. So today, Diego also has two kids. Our kids are friends. He's. Uh, we've worked on many projects together. He's, we, I'm working with him right now on a project. We've been through so many ex life experiences, uh, fights, discussions, you know, you know, all sorts of parties, 
you know, all sorts of things we've been through. He's the executor of my will. You know, I'm, I'm not even kidding you. Like, this is one of the first connections I made in Vancouver. And we've been through so many things. I've like, sometimes I'm like, fuck this guy. I never want to see him to like being his best friend again to like all sorts of things. Um, you know, and I, and I really appreciate that friendship, you know, and it's not, it's not a direct networking thing, but over the years, so the other thing that the reason why I bring him up is because, uh, we both had companies at the same time. So he had his own animation studio called brain case. Um, and I had my own thing and we would just talk sometimes as peers, you know, like, Hey, what are your challenges? How do you feel about this thing? How do you charge for projects? Or what do you do when the client doesn't pay you? What do you do about invoicing? What do you get an advance? Do you, how do you write an invoice? Like things, simple things like that. Do you, you know, do this? Do you do that? You know, what are your After Effects files like? You know, we would talk about the big things, the small things, the frustrating things, the fun things, and it would be over a coffee or it would be over, you know, a meal and be like, hey, let's meet up. I, have, I need to vent about, I'm just going through this really stressful project. Let's bitch about this client, you know, together. And it was like, uh, we've done that for years now. So 2006 to 2020. Four, right? It is 2024, right? So yeah, um, yeah, I do the math. So, um, yeah, but it started off with like, if some of y'all are international students or if you're new to, you know, something, uh, just a friendship you can make today, it can go really, really far, you know? And I really, for me, that's one connection that I really, for me, it's pivotal because it taught me a lot of things about the industry, about life, about work. I've learned, learned a lot of things about animation from him, but I've also learned about being a human being from him, you know? Uh, so I appreciate that. Thank you for that. That's, that sounds incredible. Um, how amazing that the first person you meet ends up being, yeah. So one of the first people ends up being so important. So we've sort of talked about organically meeting people um, without necessarily having, you know, an agenda or a focus, more just being open to connections. And then sometimes we get really lucky and those connections kind of just bloom into, you know, who knows, take us on, on a variety of pathways. Um, however, for some, uh, for some artists, I know within your animation company for sure, right? I mean, you need to find clients, you need to find people that are going to be, you, you need to find, you know, publishers or so on and so forth. Are there, um, beyond this kind of organic build, uh, are there strategies that you've used that have helped you connect with folks that are like, let's say directly in line with, you know, maybe some of the, some of the services you're, you're offering or things that you're creating or maybe potential partnerships with, with people. I know we kind of started getting into it a little bit, Jazz, right? Your, your answer started getting into that. Um, but I'm wondering if there's, yeah, anything specific we haven't touched on, maybe, maybe Kunal in particular. Um, sure. Um, I think with networking, there's like, it's like, many types of networking. There's networking at events, there's networking in like via, you know, long distance, like, hey, some cold, cold emails. There's networking in college, you're like your peers, your friends. So there's all sorts of ways in which you can um, um, go about it. But, um, so I think, so, so the specific, it's kind of like industry specific ways maybe of, of meet or, or of so, meeting folks yeah. in the industry. Yeah. So I think, uh, so again, I think one of the first things I said was like, it shouldn't be a cold, um, it shouldn't come across as networking in that sense. Uh, and the, and the way I, I look at it is that before you start networking, you should try to build yourself. Like, what are you about? Like, what, what do you have to say for about, your work about what is what do you where are you at with your own uh, work um, and adding value to something. So I think the first thing before one starts networking is to first start building your own self, be it your skill, be it your uh, be it your personality, be it your things that you're interested in. So when you when you have to have something to start off networking with, you can't be networking with the vacuum, with nothing to offer, right? Because that's very very um, 
that's a huge waste of time, right? Just hustling for the sake of hustling. You have to have something to offer. So, okay, so what do you have something? You have some work to offer, you have a unique point of view to offer, you have, you have uh, this very specific way in which you see the world. That's something that's a starting point. That is what you use to start networking with. So sometimes you need to ask yourself the hard question, what do you actually have to offer of value? What is it that you're, why should someone want to see what you have to offer, right? And you can spend the rest of your life questioning yourself and doubting yourself. That's a separate thing altogether. But the first thing about it is that you need to have something to begin with, of something of value, something that you think that, I love doing this, you're, I'm passionate about this. I don't care if the world doesn't uh, think, but I love to do this. That's your starting point. And when you have a strong starting point, a lot of things become natural. So if I'm passionate about uh, painting walls, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, that's my passion. I, I dream about it morning to night. If I'm passionate about cooking, that's my passion. Every conversation, it, it will be a logical step, right? I will bring that in. Um, so I think identifying your starting point is the first thing in networking, and then a lot of things uh, organically happen after that. Like, um... Um, yeah, just to piggyback off what um, Kamal just said, um, in the first place, I am not. I'm not like an organized um, group type of person. Um, you will probably create an organization and I'm not the kind of person who will be in the organization. I'm not the kind of person who likes like groups of people who shows up, you know, I try my best to attend parties and things like that, but I'm, it's just not my style. I'm, I think I do better with one-on-one -on -one connections with people, conversations, and then, um, yeah, that's usually how I go. But, um, Talking about what he just said right now, which is offering value, I think is one of the most important things when networking with people. Um, if you, and because I'm also not an organized group kind of person, I tend to do a lot of research before I meet someone. If I want to network with people or with someone or with a company, I like to do some research to know what they need. Um, that is probably also uh, an interaction design, designer's point of view, which is kind of like looking into what, what are the, the user's needs and how can I meet those needs, right? If you're connecting with someone and you want to network with someone, think to yourself, what, what do I have of value and how do I present that to you? So it's no longer just a case of, um, I would love to meet you. It's now a case of, I think I have something that you would need. I think I have something that I can offer to you. I think I have some sort of value to bring to you, to your company. Um, I think there is a value that we can both give to each other. So kind of like putting it in that way, I think really helps um, with networking. Just because um, I feel like even just as friends and things like that, there's a difference between um, just, hey, um, I really want this from you. I really need this from you, that kind of thing. I need a job, things like that. And then there's a, there's the other side, which is, hey, I do this. I know how to do this. And I really do think that I can offer, like, this is the value that I bring to the table, right? This is something that I know how to do. This is my strong point, And this is how I can present that. So knowing how to sell, not sell yourself, but honestly, as artists and designers, you do need to know how to present yourself well. Um, and another thing is in the real world or in out in the job market, the way you present yourself to everyone is completely different. The way you will present yourself to, um, let's say, a hiring manager is completely different to the same way you present yourself to the CPO who knows more about products, right? It's completely different as um, how you present yourself to someone who is just like looking for connections, just general level. So you need to know when to, you know, put the heavy stuff in and when to not put the heavy stuff in is kind of what I'm trying to say. So, yeah. Uh, seconded on the doing research. Um, my agent and I did have that conversation after things got very real, but we had, like, I had researched her beforehand. She had researched me before she had reached out. Um, so, like, even though the conversation happened, there's already so much work on both sides going before it. Um, I cannot, I mean, okay, I guess I'm old now, but, like, I, I cannot stress, at least for my generation, how much just having a website and a, on your website very easily being able to go to your email is useful. Um, it's also, it's good for a few things for you, like being able to sell yourself to be able to just go really fast to this website. Um, 
also for friends because like um, it was been mentioned, like sometimes you have connections and then if somebody gets a job that they don't have capacity to or somebody who they need somebody in the field, your field, they can just be like, go here. Um, and also passive stuff, people find me and send me messages and they're like, do you want to do this thing? And I'm like, this went to my spam. But um, yeah, um, the other thing is for um, on research, there's also the research that you're doing authentically too, which is like remembering what people say. So I do Vancouver Comic Arts Convention. And I think one of my strengths is that I generally remember like conversations that I've had with people from previous years. And I do try to have conversations go to so I can remember somebody specifically. Um, and I do think one of the reasons I have people that come back every year that's like, oh, I want to see what your new work is. It's not just because... Um, it's not just because you make good work, but it's because you are demonstrating that these people actually like matter to you. Um, and that ability to remember, even if it honestly, even if it's just like, I want to write down little things about people and that has led to like commissions and some job offers. So, yeah. That's so important. Um, for those of you in the room that are in visual arts, there's the international, um, Toronto, it's called Art Toronto, which is sort of Canada's international art fair um, that's, um, that's happening now. And exactly what you're saying, Jazz, of sort of, uh, I, I remember going for the first time and I was kind of, anyway, working at a gallery at a time. And yeah, you would sort of maybe even take like, I don't know, a coffee break or something, literally just so that you could go in, in a quiet space and be like, okay, what was this name? Okay, write a few things. Oh yeah, they've got a cat. There's this, there's that. Just so that later on, you know, you can you can show that, yeah, that additional interest. And it is genuine. It's just, I don't know, my brain is like sometimes <laughs> you've got to just give it the help, right, that, that you need. Um, yeah, so it's interesting to see how kind of in... Um, uh, the other thing I noticed with your responses is regardless of the industry, right, because you're all working in different industries, this idea of thinking of what it is that you offer of value and really showing that in a way um, that is uh, where you're highlighting that, right, and making it like it's a sparkly treasure, right? You're offering something to the world, something that's, that's unique to you, uh, but also identifying needs. And this is like, you know, if we're not in business school, but I'm looking over there at somebody who uh, is from that realm. And that's kind of like one of the number one pieces of advice, right? Is like identify the need and then sort of take it from there. Um, anyway, thank you for your answers. Um, who, should, who, should we, who should we put in the hot seat next? Um, hmm. Okay, Nimi, <laughs> are you up for it? Um, <laughs> so you've definitely worked on community-centered projects, right? You were telling us about the manicure mixer. It's super exciting to hear that it's gonna be something that is like regular and is just like folded into the fabric of the city now. So kudos, truly, like that's amazing. Um, the, the question is how do you approach how do you approach networking uh, when building relationships with underrepresented communities uh, or fostering dialogue in your work? And I think you were talking about this, how like there's a smaller population here, right? Compared to like East Coast or whatever of black people. And so how do you, how do you, I don't know, kind of, yeah, bring, bring folks together. You were talking a little bit about sort of, um, um, now I'm thinking in French, uh, <laughs> You, you were talking about people just kind of passing by even and noticing like, oh, there's a thing happening, maybe I can join. Um, can you speak to some of those approaches just of, of, of outreach? Um, yeah, I think um, my focus is working with communities and like specific communities or underrepresented marginalized communities. Um, and I think one of the things, the main things or things that are very important to me is... Um, kind of like acknowledging my position in that community. Um, it's a bit easier for me when working with the black community because I am black. I have, you know, some of those lived experiences and um, I have the, um, like, 
essentially I am part of the community. So I have experience with the community. Um, but when it comes to like people who, if you're not a part of the community, but you want to work with a specific community, I would say like kind of acknowledging your position there. One of the first things I always do, even when working with my community, is kind of just seeing myself um, as the facilitator, right? I don't see myself as the designer. I see myself as the person who is here to facilitate their lived experiences. So even though the manicure mixer was like an event, it was still a design research project, right? Um, one of the ways that also, um, one of the things that I would say is when working with, um, with communities like that, it is very easy to break trust. Um, it's hard to rebuild the trust. And one of the things that can 100% or one of the easiest ways to break trust is if the design outcome doesn't reflect the community. So you say you want to design with this community and then you take all of this information and the outcome doesn't reflect what the community told you. Like it, making sure that the voice of the community is present in the design outcome just as much as in the design process. Um, and then when it comes to bringing the community together, um, I honestly, it's just like put the word out. For my events, it was easy or easier. Honestly, every single one of my events has sold out in two hours. I put out the tickets and it's one of those things where I'm like, guys, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have any more tickets for you. Even though there's not a lot of black people in the community, if you're providing value, they're going to want to come. If you, if you want to bring people together, which is why it is so important. And this is not just marginalized people as well. My whole thesis or my whole design process is kind of like going against the idea of universal design or trying to design for everyone. I'm like, you can't design for everyone. You need to design more for specificity and then that can be expanded, right? If you're focusing on designing for everyone, you're going to end up losing out so much. And so that is why when you're designing with a small community, look for something that, is, um, re that resonates with them. Um, if I want to design with an example that I always use, which is something very, um, that also resonates is like, if I want to design a product for car lovers, or I want to design a car, something easy that I would be able to do is, um, do the research, let's say at a mechanic shop while everyone is waiting for their cars to be fixed, the little sitting area where they all sit together and they start talking about all these things as a car manufacturer, that's where I will find out all the things that the, what do you call it? That the, the, um, car lovers need, right? In that little space where they're just like bitching about, oh, sorry, <laughs> where they are talking about, um, you know, what they're frustrated with in their car. That is where you find the real answers and that is where you find the needs and the, like the pain points, right? So when you're designing for marginalized groups or just any group of people, try to find out what exactly brings them together, something that resonates with them in a way that makes them comfortable enough for you to design with them, not just for them is kind of the way I see it. So don't put yourself as like designer and then participants. It is facilitator and then the community because they, ha they have the lived experiences. Even as a regular designer, your users know what they need best. You don't know better than the, your users, right? Um, it, that's kind of how I would put it. Yeah, that's a, that's such an important piece of advice. And the other, the other thing that you said... Um, was maybe speaking to kind of uh, reciprocity, right? And making sure that you're actually not just taking their ideas and then being like, all right, see you later, but actually like giving them back something that's useful for them. Um, and that's, yeah, that, that makes sense in, in kind of building that out. Thank you. And I also feel like that also helps with elongating the relationship, like, right? If the thing that you've designed um, actually reflects the community, they f also feel some sense of ownership and they want to continue, right? They're like, okay, we helped build this product. We helped make this project what it is today. And then we want to continue, which is like what most of the things that I want to do is like, I want to design for a community, but I'm really hoping that they can continue it, right? Like they can take it forward and um, what do you call it? Like it can be self-sustaining by the community. But if the results doesn't reflect the community, they don't want to be a part of it, then how do you even get feedback on how to improve things? It's important that they can they can get a certain sense of ownership, as you say. Yeah, I have more questions, but I'm wondering if anyone in the audience has anything that they want to 
that they want to throw to the to the panelists or any thoughts that you have on networking that you want to share. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Jemmy. Hello, thank you very much for coming here. I appreciate it a lot. Um, my question would be like, how to navigate between opportunities? Like, um, I find it difficult to like uh, navigate between like, there's so, sometimes like many opportunities comes in and like people asking and like, how do, you, how do you navigate between like, just refusing versus accepting like, like how do you how do you sort of qualify the opportunities to decide which ones are, are worth taking up? Okay, that's a good that's a good question. Or or just basically when to refuse right. opportunities. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. You can't um, do it all. Yeah, that's not a question I will accept <laughs> because um, my niche is very specific. Um, I don't get a lot of opportunities. You have to go looking for them and like. Um, you have to do like the research and try to find where. So I'm, I'm kind of hoping you guys get more opportunities than I do. So, um, so in animation, I guess it's uh, and also also uh, aside from that, like owning your own company, like you can't really predict how much work is going to come in at any point in time. So my thing from the beginning of like is till today is that always say yes. I always say yes. Uh, I don't. I know there's a logic in which people say. I mean, and of course, I'm not going to do something that doesn't make sense from my worldview or my politics or my sense of right and wrong. Of course, that I would never do that. But in terms of work itself, I, it's like I always, tr I always try to find something uh, of value in that project and try to. Okay, even if it's a. Uh, I, I've, there are times in which I'm working on eight animation films at the same time, and there are times for eight months I'm not working on a single thing. So it's like I know that it goes up and down, and so when it's there, you try, you do it because it's not always going to be there. And if it's there, try to find something that you can make sense of in that. So one film could be, okay, make a film on the opioid crisis, and there's a lot of things to get into and to bite your teeth into and learn and get into. And another thing could be something very, very, yeah, you just make something that's shiny and reflective and cool. And But even in that, you should find something of value in it, right? So it, I'm, all I'm trying to say is that like every project has an inherent, um, has opportunities for you to find value in it. And if you take it, then it's, you're not wasting your time, as long as it meets the basic criteria of you know, your values. Um, so I say yes to everything. Uh, first of all, if they refer to you by your Instagram handle, you Google that message and see if it's a scam. Um, um, but I think in the case, if you do have to say no to something, um, you can maintain the relationship for a future opportunity without necessarily overexerting yourself in the present. Um, and ways to do that can be like saying, I'm not available now, but like at this point I am, or even asking them about their timeline to be like, hey, can you accommodate like in a few months or whatever. Um, you can also, um, if you really don't have the time, if you, connections, if you can refer them to somebody else, then they, then you have given them value and been like, yeah, I want to work with you later. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't want to add exactly that. So even, I, it's not true, I have, I'm, sometimes I say no to a project, but in the no is a yes for someone else. And then you, so you can say like, hey, I can't do this, but my friend here can, or that person I know, and then you're doing you're doing a good deed, and that will you know that's that's good you know it, it, don't close that door it can it, just because you can't do it someone else can so you open a door for someone else so every opportunity is and should be met with a uh, you know some someone should get, get some value out of that yeah thank you so much yeah I'm more of a yes person too but sometimes that gets me in trouble right we've all gotten into trouble and I think that part of Part of this, uh, this is a great question, by the way. Uh, thank you for it. But part of the question also sort of involves, um, uh, come on, mm, workload, no? And how we manage all of that. And I think as artists and designers and, you know, creative people, that's sort of the double-sided nature of the work. It's not you show up to a job and then that's your job and that's it and then you go home. It's like, well, you've got your job, which is the stuff that you're making or doing, 
But then there's all that back end stuff, right? All of the admin and the managing the relationships and the saying yes or no and the writing the emails and the da 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 and all of these things. And so, um, yeah, I'm wondering if maybe we can speak to that a little bit. And and I'm, uh, I feel like I I asked you a question recently, Kunal. But honestly, um, having done animation myself in the past and no longer doing it because that stuff is wild that is like oh my gosh like I think all creative people work very hard but that is like next level no animation is totally next level and so I'm wondering how um maybe I'll ask you and then and then everybody else right but how how do you uh how do you navigate that how do you keep building relationships, keeping those connections fresh, keeping people feeling like you're, you're, you're holding them and not just, oh yeah, we did something and now you're dropped off the face of the earth to me. I have no time for you. Like, how do you, do you have a system how you kind of navigate your, your extreme workload in making your work, but then also navigating, yeah, the relationships? Yeah, so I think there's, there's a few parts to this question, so I'll try to break it down. First is the thing of working on multiple things at the same time and workload, I think that came up. Um, so I think the work that we do isn't very straightforward in the sense of like, imagine there's like a, a zillion bricks on this side of the room and your job is to put all those bricks one by one and put it on that side of the room. Now that's a fairly you know, straightforward task to figure out in your head. So you can only do it at a certain pace you could be super strong and you do a little bit faster than someone else, but basically that job itself is pretty uh, cut and dry in some ways, right? Like you can, you can wrap your head around it. But what we do is offer creative solutions, whether it's in design or it's in animation. And so sometimes just having a straightforward conversation with the client saying that, hey, this is your budget. So it's not just time, sometimes it's the budget, sometimes budgets are low. And you're like, hey, this is what I usually charge, but you have a lower budget. I don't want to say no to you, but what I will offer is this and you, you'll get you'll get what you need but I won't be doing the same amount of work that I would do for a client who pays me the full price right so you can reverse engineer your work to find a yes answer that works for the client but also for you so in animation I know how I would do that but in your line of work you have to figure out that thing like where the client gets value but you're also not going absolutely nuts trying to uh, deliver, right? So um, I would say that's how I've sometimes, like I was saying that eight projects at the same time, that was happening when my second daughter was being born. That that month, I didn't... So it's, you just have to figure out a way in which you're not absolutely going crazy, but also you're also delivering something of value. And it's not always the same amount of work. Like sometimes I made a film which took me a year to do, and sometimes I made a film that took me four days to do. Of course, they're very different kinds of films, but the client doesn't sometimes, they need what, as long as they get something that makes sense to them, that's good, that's good enough. So that's the part of the thing about the workload part, right? Like where it's like, how do you, um, another thing is I think time can be uh, made to be backwards. Like, so, so it's not a linear thing. Like it's gonna take me one minute to break, take a brick from here to there. So therefore a million bricks would be a million minutes. No, it's not like that. You can say, okay, I have, three days to do this project. What's the best thing I can do? Knowing everything I know, all the tricks, all the you know tricks up my sleeve, all the things I've learned in design school, all the things I learned in high school, how can I bring all my lived experience to bring value to those? So those three days in which I actually work, I actually bring something of value to the table, right? And so the answer that each of you bring, the way you bring th your use your three days is gonna be the interesting thing, right? If I tell you, oh, you have all the time and all the money in the world to make anything you want, then we, you know, that's that's never gonna happen. But if I put this constraint to you, like, that's when you really de reach deep inside of yourself and say like, okay, how do I use all my design chops uh, in aesthetic, you know, things to, to solve this, essentially a design problem. Um, I, I feel like I somewhat, you I went feel, somewhere? I feel like we got somewhere. I yeah, rambled. I feel like we got somewhere. No, it was great. Something, Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'll open it up to the room uh, once more or to the chat. If there's anyone on the chat, we can use a mic. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry. So far, I'm the only 
uh, one of the panelists who's not cool and hasn't sworn, so I'm going to say Fork. Yes, I've watched The Good Place. <laughs> I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, maybe, maybe. Um, oh, sorry. Did you have a question? I see you holding a mic, so probably you do. Go I do have it. a question. Um, I'm wondering, like, do you have any uh, tips for people who they feel they're good at talking to people, but are still building confidence in their skills that they are trying to offer? Um, ask people how you can like ask people how you can get better because like so many people um, have a part of them that either wants to teach or that um, some people want to be like feel good about themselves um, so if you go up to them and ask them then you can start building a relationship while you're still building your skills and then it's a cool thing because if you then come back a year later and they've seen how like the progress then they're like oh not only is this person like fun to talk with, but they know how to learn, they know how to listen. They can be like a really good someone to work with. Um, something else I would say is read. Um, read books, um, talk to people, um, have design discussions, um, listen to design podcasts, there's so much information, there's so much knowledge out there whereby sometimes you don't even know what you don't know. Um, sometimes you don't know what you need to know. And it's one of those things where listening, um, reading, and just generally, honestly, I, I feel like talking about design, you learn so much about design. Just like throwing back and forth, having discussions, things like that. Um really help. So even in spaces like that, when you are still trying to build your skill, which does take time, it takes practice, things like that, um, especially as an interaction designer, which you are, um, knowing about, um, like, if you're still building your skills, um, focus on, like, UX research, right? Those are things that you can talk to people about, you can learn about, things like that. And the truth about it is when you're in a space with people, you're not, they're not seeing um, your design skills, Right. They're not seeing how well you can, you know, design an app or they're not seeing all these things. Right. But they want to know is how you're thinking about design. They want to know um, what your thoughts are. They want to know how your design process is. Right. So build on that, I would say, would be the best way because um, the my mentor who taught me how to design would always tell me very early on when I didn't even know how to do anything. He would tell me straight up. He's like there will get to a point in time where um, UI will be some like an app will be able to design the UI. The UI will not be will not be as important, but like the design thinking in itself, the the being able to figure out the problems and things like that, that is the main thing. That's where the value is in. Not necessarily like you can design an app, but if it doesn't work, it doesn't make sense, right? You can design a product if it doesn't work, it doesn't make sense. So what you need to figure out is how to think about design, how to think through things. So yeah, just like read, arm yourself with knowledge and honestly just talk to a lot of people. Like be like the greatest asset that I got out of Emily Carr was my cohort um, because I don't have an undergrad degree in design. I went to construction. I have a BS in like construction engineering, stuff like that. But being in a space with other designers from different disciplines, being able to talk to them and making connections with them was like the biggest thing that I got out of it. So don't, I know it's it's different when you're maybe an introvert or anything, but if you're in class and they're talking about design, talk with them, right? Like try your best to pitch in or at least be present during design discussions. Because if you don't know how to talk about design, it's going to be hard for you to be a designer, right? Like what half of the thing, like take your presentation seriously, you know, being able to, express yourself and show your work is almost as important as the work, right? Because if no one knows what you're talking about and if no one understands it, you're not going to be able to, you know, get further. But yeah. What a great, what a great question. Um, yeah, I think uh, you're basically asking about how do you balance your, your um, work 
your portfolio and your, what you're working and your skill set with your ability to put yourself out there, right? I mean, is that something? Kind of. Like, yeah. like I feel... <laughs> That's okay. Um, I feel like I can almost talk about my work better than my work can show itself, I suppose. That, like, uh, I can explain things easier with words than my work can show its purpose for itself, I suppose. So I suppose that's more like technical skills. Um, but I'm curious about how to believe in your, your skills, I suppose. Um, and then how to present that belief in yourself and your skills to the people that you you want to work for or you want them to have hire you i mean i think that's uh that's like a lifelong process and i think it's it's great that you have the uh insight that you've, you and the honesty to say that like you're able to uh, you prefer talking about your work versus uh letting the work kind of you know communicate that so that's a very honest statement i would say that part of the whole thing of being a professional designer or an artist is having the work actually do the talking. So so I think um, what you're saying is a confession, which is great. You need to, you know, that's, a, that's most of us, if we, it's a good place to start to know that this is my, this is where I'm at. And now you have the time and the opportunity to work towards the thing where you slowly let your, what can I do to make my work say the thing that I know? I, I know I want this film to be about, you know, uh, loss. Well, I know I want this product to be this kind of thing. Like, you know, how do I make sure that even if I'm not in the room, the product does that or the film says that? Because often we will not be there in the room to, to do that, right? So, so you're starting from a place of honesty, of acknowledging that this is where I'm at right now, and I need to be better. And I think everyone is in that somewhere on that spectrum of being better. Know that everyone in the world is winging it. Is no one knows what they're doing. High up in whatever you know, design fancy job that you know you think every no one knows what they're doing. Everyone's in different stages of winging it. You know, some people wing it better than others. But you, I, I, the only thing I would say to you is that you definitely need to w strive to be at a place where your work is doing the talking rather than yourself. Yeah. Um, and just to add to that um, also is, because I'm seeing this from an interaction designer's point of view, and I would say strip your work down, right? Like... At the very core of every interaction design project is the needs, the like the work itself, like what value it's offering. Like art is a bit more subjective. Design is not very subjective. Good design works, right? So at the end of the day, it's focusing on what the user needs and if your project or your product is offering that to the user. So if you're trying to design a calculator, for instance, right? there will be no need to explain about what it does if it does what it's supposed to do, right? So looking at it just from an interaction designer's point of view is um, start with, you know, actually focusing on low fidelity and, you know, like focusing on how it works before how it looks. I feel like you can always practice how it's going to look. You can change it up, change the style guide, change so many things at the end of the day about how it will look Right, but it, it's more um, it's more impactful if it actually works. So just focus on it's working, and if it works and it resonates with the users, if it does what it's supposed to do, it will be easier to show what it's supposed to do. That's kind of how I I see it. Thank you. Those are great. Yeah, some good questions. Do we have time for one more from the crowd? Do we? Yeah. Okay. I don't think it was more of a question. It was just to add on to what you asked. I'm Sid, by the way. Hi, guys. Um, uh, just to mention when you said that how do you bring confidence in your work when you're showcasing it, or sometimes when somebody sees that or looks at your work and how do you th know that it's good? Oftentimes, it's a preconceived bias for our ourselves that we think that they know more or we don't know enough 
or sometimes we think certain things are obvious and we don't mention them. Um, and I feel this particular panel itself is an example because so many of these things that you just talked about, we often think that we know about it, but we don't. And there are there's always some thread that comes up that you say that you think or either relate to or you think that okay, you never knew about this. So no matter what your work is, just laying it all out as if like a story and as a narrative that you think about your work or how you plan your work is very important because sometimes they will bring out that thread that they they will know that okay, th this is how you did it, and they may not have may not be aware about those things, which because. All of these details that you work on, you know about them. So it's obvious to you, but not them. So just sharing all of that is still important. And I feel like that itself builds a lot of confidence in the work piece of work that you're sharing or like putting out. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so maybe, maybe we'll start uh, winding things down or maybe winding them up. I don't know what this question's going to do. Uh, but I'd like to know if you could bring yourself back to um, when you were a student. And I, I know for for some it's, it's more recent than for others. But if you can project yourself back there. <laughs> if you can project yourself back there yesterday or years ago um what <laughs> yeah you're gonna ace this question i think what what is a piece of advice you would give yourself back when you were a student right so think back okay i'm a student i need to go out and build my community what's a piece of advice now like knowing what you know now what would you tell um you know younger jazz Nimi, or kunal what would you tell them Yeah, so I graduated in 2008, so obviously everything has changed from then. Um, for one, like social media wasn't a thing then, you know, it was, Facebook was just starting up. It was still about like party photos, very, very badly shot party photos. That was the extent of Facebook. I don't know if anyone remembers that. Um, things have changed a lot. So I think... If I, so if I was a student today, not in 2008, what would I say? What's, because for me, that's... I mean, CD-ROMs right now are <laughs> less useful. Yeah. So yeah, maybe if you were a student now. Yeah. CD-ROMs, no. Um, yeah, I think uh, I would say to not to really go for it. You know, there's, again, everyone's winging. I, I used to think that there was a way to do things, and I was always waiting to do it the right way. Oh, I think oh, I, I don't do that the right way. I'm not good enough in always second guessing. You know, that person's technique is better, and oh, I, I don't know how to draw as well. I don't know how to do this. I don't know three D. Ah, blah, blah, blah. Always ways to like stop myself from, you know. Uh, that's that's my blind spot. I'm always like second guessing myself. Uh, animation can be a pretty can be a very technical thing. There's one side of it that's technical, another side of it that's not. And I'd always like use these technical things to like, oh, I should. Ah, I'm not good. Not. Uh, and I just, if I could go back and say, like, just do it. Everyone's, you know, in a second guessing. So you just, the person who puts it out there, you know, that's who we see, right? Not, not the person who's like, got it all right and everything has to be perfectly laid out. And only then I should go and make this magnum opus for the world. It's never going to happen. Um, so, I mean, I've done that in a very long, drawn out, you know, very, you know, laborious way. And if I could just tell myself, like, screw it, just do it, you know, save yourself a lot of heart, heart, heartache, just do it, you know. That's one thing. Um, another thing I, I would say, not just to myself as a student, but to uh, other students, is to, uh, some, to go back to the basics always, you know. Like, we're, there's a lot of buzzwords, there's a lot of, there's a lot of terminology that is used very lightly. And I, I would recommend just re revisiting what words mean. Words mean something, you know? So when you say networking, that means something. When you say engagement, it means something. It comes from a certain... And to try to go back to the basics, what does engagement really mean? Today, if you ask someone what does engagement mean, they'll be like, oh, the number of clicks on something and the number of views and the number... Blah, 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 blah. And you're like, that's just... 
that's sure, that's one way of looking at, that's one metric or, or kind of lingo, but to actually engage with people, that's where engagement comes from. Are you interested in history? That's engaging with history. Are you in, interested in politics? That's engaging. So engagement at a, at a meta level is actually gonna help you a lot, right? Like rather than like measuring your metrics of how many views did I get in this video or that project. And so go back to the basics. And, and I think one thing about design, uh, we, this is an art school, a design school, an animation school, a film school. But I think uh, I, I'm a design student even before I came to animation. So I, I like to look at things from a design point of view. And a designer looks at the world in a very specific way. It's always about bringing it back to this basics, always simple simplicity. And I think whenever you're confused, whenever you're you know stuck, just trying to get back to the basics. What? How do I keep it simple? How do I? Uh, that would be my advice to anyone as a student, and even to myself. Like, don't overcomplicate. <clears throat> Jazz. As long as you keep your locks, if you decide to have locks later, they can actually put them back on. <laughs> If you wait longer, it's just gonna be harder for you to experiment for new with new hairstyles. Your locks are messy. You haven't had a different hairstyle since third grade. Just cut them off. Um, but also, <laughs> I got my hair done by black people for the first time in like 20 years, like two years ago. That was my first haircut in ages. Anyways, um, I would tell myself to be curious and be humble. Um, I think that there is, um, and there, those two are very highly connected. Um, like, there is, like, I still have this problem where, like, I will have a burning question, but I won't ask it because I don't think it will be cool to ask it. Um, and, like, like you were saying, like, I won't post things because it's not perfect. Um, the people who I've seen, like, from my, like, graduating year who are, like, some of the most successful people, um, not just of, like, our core, but, like, are very successful in their field, are the people who were voraciously curious and were asking questions no matter how like obnoxious it might have seemed um, and they continue to do that in their lives and then the people who were some of these people were not the people who stood out back in university but they were people who were always putting themselves out there often with work that maybe wasn't as strong in some ways as other people but because they were chill with that and we're good with like taking feedback and being like oh hey this is something that I need to work on um that those attitudes those abilities to like learn is what allowed them to keep learning because if you're somebody who is I don't know gifted and praised early on and like you only accept you you relate like self-worth with success then once you don't have that success you might hit a wall the people who are curious and humble always going to keep on going um, for myself, it would be um, don't dilly-dally. Um, like I said earlier, I'm one, once I was done with school, um, I was kind of like, I don't want anyone to talk to me about design for the next four months. I was not applying to jobs, not doing anything. I'm like, I need a break from talking about design. And it was valid, honestly. I had just finished my thesis. It was a huge workload. And I just I just needed a break because honestly, that's another thing is um, being able to take lived experiences and put them into your design. You get way more things than if you're just kind of stuck in the same bubble, right? You're recycling things. You're not getting enough. So I was like, okay, I needed a break. But however, I would say is try to keep your connections even when you're not actively in the field, right? When I was done, when I did my like thesis, I got a lot of recommendations like, hey, people were sending me um, like articles. You should reach out to this person. You know, they're doing something similar as you. Um, you should look into this. And I was like, mm, not right now. <laughs> I was not interested in doing that. And it's much harder to kind of go back and be like, hey, five months ago, someone said I should do this and I didn't, but I've been this. And, and it's just easier to, you know, hold on to those connections and at still put some effort into being in the space, even when you're not mentally in the space, right? You know, just send the email saying, hey, you know, I will reach out at this point in time. I'm taking a break. So they're actively aware that you're not just ghosting, right? 
So it's one of those things that I will tell myself, like, even if you're not there in the space right now, don't dilly dally, you know, take advantage of recommendations, take advantage of connections that you're making right now, because outside in like the job markets, these connections and recommendations, they don't wait for you, right? Like they, they're not going to always be there. So you need to be able to find a way to hold on to them while still, it, it kind of goes back to the saying no, but like still saying yes. Saying no in a way that still holds on to the value and still like, so later on when you're ready, you still have that tie and that connection. Um, so yeah, that's what I would tell myself because I'm still dealing with that um, situation seeing as I just got out of school in May. So. Well, what a wealth of amazing information and good advice, good tips. I hope everybody took notes. If you didn't, to recap, um, <laughs> I think the number one was ask questions, right? And don't feel shy or afraid or uh, what was, you, you used a good word, which I can't recall now, but uh, oh yeah, you were like, don't be afraid of being obnoxious <laughs> with your questions, right? Um, and so that I think has, has come up again and again in the conversation. Um, this one is for all the Vancouverites in the room. Don't wait for permission, right? Um, I feel like here there's a there's a real waiting for, oh, well, you know, I got to wait and see till I get the, the grant or the thing. Uh, no, just just do it. Don't wait for permission. You also said don't wait for perfection. Don't wait for energy. Don't wait for inspiration. Just like do it, right? Confidence will come from doing the things. Yeah. So do the things. Don't wait for perfection. Uh, posting works in progress or even things that aren't perfect are always going to be better than posting bad party photos, right? Uh, so yeah, hopefully everybody's gotten a little, a little more inspiration to go out there and build their communities and uh, networks. I know I have, so I want to thank you three for being so generous with us today and sharing your practices, uh, your advice, the the kind of behind the curtains of how you work. I think as, as creative people, we always just show up telling the world that, you know, everything's easy and we're geniuses and we woke up like this. But uh, it's so important to be able to have these conversations. So thank you for that vulnerability with us um, today. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.